It's true, my name is David Cobb, and I like to say I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days I am a pissed off American citizen. Good, I'm glad to see some heads nod immediately as soon as I say that, because I think it's important that uh, I'll also say that I will self-identify as a political progressive. And as a progressive, I think that we make a mistake if we allow the Tea Party to claim a monopoly on political anger. Because I talk to Tea Party people, and yes, they're angry. And when you have a conversation with them about their anger, I have found nine out of ten of them will tell you, I'm angry about the fact that Wall Street America and the big bankers destroyed the economy of this country, and then our government, or the government, rewarded them with a trillion dollars of our tax money. Well, you know what? I'm angry about that too, aren't you? And I don't think that we should allow the Tea Party to be the only place where that kind of anger is expressed. Because I'll tell you something else, and I mean this sincerely. I'm also angry about the fact that 25% of the children in the United States of America are going to bed hungry at night. And I rarely hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. I'm angry about the fact that the economic system is basically destroying the life support system, you know, the earth that we depend upon for our very survival and causing runaway global climate crisis. And I don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. And I'm angry about the fact that the United States of America is a fundamentally racist, sexist, and class oppressive society. And I damn sure don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. And I'll tell you something, folks, the anger that I'm talking about is a good thing. Because the anger I'm describing is righteous anger. You see, there's something very peculiar about righteous anger. If you just get angry about something and you just stay stewing and you're angry and you're just mad, that is not righteous anger by definition. In fact, that's a dangerous kind of anger. It's dangerous emotionally, physically, spiritually, in every way. You see, righteous anger is unique because it requires righteous action. And let me suggest to you that it was righteous political anger that fueled the abolitionist movement in this country. It was righteous political anger that drove those women of Seneca Falls to be willing to stand up against the patriarchal society they were living in. It was righteous political anger that fueled the trade union movement, the civil rights movement. Righteous political anger is a good thing. And I'll tell you something else, folks. I'm also angry because I can remember what... It was like to be able to say that I was a proud and patriotic American with no other qualifier. And for me, that's when I was a little boy. When I was taught that I was from the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, and that my country stood for liberty and justice and equality. And I was so proud to be from that country. And not only that, but my country was like some great shining light on the hill. And it was going to guarantee liberty and justice and equality for the entire world. And I was so proud to be from that country. And you know why I'm angry? Because I grew up and realized I had been lied to. But I want to be clear. It's not the kind of lie you normally think about. Because I have a face and a name that I associate with that, let's call it the creation myth of this country. And for me, that name, that, that face, that person is Mrs. Armstrong. She was my fifth grade teacher. And th before I go any further, are there any former, current, or to-be public teachers in this crowd? Any at all? So can we get a round of applause for our public school teachers? And I mean that very seriously. Like, I want that applause for two very important reasons. Number one, I don't think that we acknowledge, applaud, and thank public school teachers enough in this country. I mean, we damn sure don't pay them enough money, right? So that needs to be done publicly, but I also wanted that round of applause in honor of, in, memorama, in memoriam of Mrs. Armstrong. Because you see, this is, when I say that she told me the creation myth or a lie, it's not like that. I mean, Mrs. Armstrong did not go to bed at night saying, Wah! I can't wait until those children come into my classroom so I can fill their mind full of lies and propaganda about how this country operates. No, 
Mrs. Armstrong was a public school teacher. And like every public school teacher I have ever met, she became a teacher because she wanted to help children to become productive members of society. She wanted to help shepherd them uh, into, into adulthood. You see, Mrs. Armstrong was a good woman. Mrs. Armstrong taught me liberty, justice, and equality in the, the American creation myth because, in essence, she believed it. And it worked on me as a little boy, and as I'm looking at the faces in this crowd, it worked on you because you wanted to believe it. And I want to be clear, we didn't want to believe it because we're Americans. We wanted to believe it because we're human beings. You see, I will submit to you that the desire to live in liberty, in justice, in equality, that desire is a human desire. And frankly, folks, I think the movement that we need to be articulating, the movement that we want to be part of, the challenge for us is to understand that this is a human rights movement. It is not an ex American exceptionalism. This is a human desire. And frankly, yes, American children want liberty, justice, and equality. And you know what? So do Iraqi children. And so do Afghani children, and Jewish children, and Palestinian children, and Mexican children. Children all over the world want that. And not only that, they and we deserve it. It's the human condition. We are supposed to be living in a different way. Fundamentally, profoundly different way. We yearn for liberty, justice, and equality because that's in our DNA. As human beings, that's what not only we deserve, but it's what we're supposed to be experiencing on our day to day. So what I'm angry about is that I have been born in to a society where all of the best impulses of being a human being are squelched or perverted, and I'm not allowed to engage in genuine cooperation. I'm dissuaded from a gift economy. I'm not allowed to actually think about the best instincts of what it is to be a human being. And instead, I'm constantly told that I have to be a consumer and I have to actually just exploit or be exploited. And everything ends up being a power over dominator model. And you know what, folks? I'm angry about the fact that it's not the world that I want to live in. Now, for me, that's the big picture stuff. I'm going to actually promise to you that for the rest of our time together in this experience, I'm going to tell you the truth as I see it, as clearly and articulately as I possibly can. And so here is the truth, folks. The United States of America is not now, it has never been, and it wasn't actually designed to be a truly functioning democracy. We have to tell that truth. And you know what? That truth was hard to say. Because how many times do you actually go to political meetings where that actually is said? But you know what? Not only did they get a round of applause from this gentleman here, but let me ask you something, folks. Don't we know that's true? We feel it. It's our lived experience. We know it's true. But almost never do you actually have people who purport to represent us or who are seeking to represent us will actually tell that truth. Well, damn it, it's time we start telling the truth. And it's an important thing that we start telling the truth because we are in a moment of crisis. In fact, it's a series of crises. We have an ecological crisis. We have an economic crisis. We have a social justice crisis. We have a moral and spiritual crisis. We have all these crises. It's a crisis of crises, and it's coming together. The most important thing that we can do is to start to tell the truth. And not so we can wallow in despair. I'm actually quite happy. Don't wallow in the truth so we can be smug and self-satisfied. We tell the truth so we can diagnose the problem. And you diagnose a problem so you can figure out how to solve it. I think the most, I got to say folks, and I, I, I say this everywhere I go, it's not just because of this particular crowd. May I say, may the goddess bless the Occupy Wall Street movement for giving us an opportunity to actually start telling the truth to one another. The fact is, the OWS movement, at its core, I mean, it's many things, right? But one of the most important things it is, is convening a space where we can actually start talking to each other and cut through the bullshit. To actually say, you know what, we're just going to have a conversation about what's really going on. And yes, it's difficult. And yes, it, 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 may, it, it may be hard to hear sometimes. But if we actually do that, then you know what? 
We don't have to front. We have to pretend, right? We can actually say, and you will see through the course of the discussion, when we get to the discussion, there will be times where I will, I, I, I predict somebody will ask a question that my answer will be, well, I don't know or I'm not sure. And I'm okay with that. Because you know what? I don't think that I need to have all the answers or that this woman needs to have all the answers or this young man needs to have all the answers, right? Like we do this together and it's an amazing thing. All right, so the United States of America isn't a functioning democracy uh, and that means that we've actually got to start actually telling the truth. Well, I'm gonna do, what I'm going to do today is actually basically tell a story. And the story is how it came to be that the modern transnational corporation is not just exercising power, but that they're ruling us. They are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect all of our lives. They're deciding how much poison will be in the water that we're all drinking or the air that we're having to breathe. Corporate CEOs are making the decision about whether we eat genetically mutated organisms in our food supply. They're making the decisions about what our transportation cho choices are. A small ruling elite are making all of the decisions about how we live our lives and we the people are left to choose between paper or plastic at the grocery store, Coke or Pepsi, right? We have all these material consumer choices but we're never given an opportunity to actually talk about the things that really matter. And so in order to tell that story I'm going to cover four basic concepts. The first one on the board is the word democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot in this country. And so in order to make sure we've got some clarity, please allow me to ask this question. What language is that from? Greek. It's from Greek. Let's break it down. Demos means? The people. Kratia means? Govern. govern or to govern or to rule. That's actually the, 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 so literally when you break it down, the word democracy means the people rule or the people govern. So here's a question. How many people here would assert that we the people are ruling in the United States? Don't be shy. Look around. Not a single hand gets raised. I do this presentation all over the country. Two-thirds of my life is spent on the road doing teach-ins and workshops and strategy sessions just like this. It is rare that anybody will even assert for a moment. Right? And folks, that's a problem. On the other hand, I would say it's a good thing. It's not a good thing that we the people are not ruling. It's a good thing that we're finally acknowledging it. That we are finally telling the truth about that. That we are cutting through the creation myth that has been shoved down our throats and that we've been propagandized in this country. It's a good thing that we're willing to look clearly, courageously, at the truth of the matter that we the people are not ruling in this country. Because I'll tell you something, the most dangerous threat to democracy in the United States of America is the mistaken belief that we actually practice or experience one. So that will lead me to my next topic which is sovereignty. Now, can anybody give me a two or three de word definition of sovereignty? Or How about this, if I just had the word sovereign up there and I asked who or what would you think of if I said the sovereign? The king. And that's because the word sovereignty literally means authority to rule. And the reason that so many of us immediately think of the king as sovereign is because 500 years ago, the word was literally synonymous. The king was the sovereign. The sovereign was the king. Why? Because the king claimed and had absolute authority to rule. And where, by the way, did the king claim his authority to rule? God! You don't get more legitimate! I mean, like, right? God? That's pretty heavy. And in, in fact, in order to illustrate this, I'm going to do a little exercise here that is always a lot of fun for me. You'll see. I'm going to invite this, this crowd to please close your eyes and go through an exercise. If you'll close your eyes and repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. And as the king, David is God's representative on earth. And therefore, everything David says must be obeyed. Okay, for those of you who are closing your eyes, open them. So, a couple of things here. I want to make an observation real quick. You realize that when I did that, all of you at first chuckled, right? It was sort of a collective chuckle. I just want to actually point out and actually honor the fact 
that this young man refused to go along with it. Right? You didn't do it, did you? It's our savior. <laughs> in the back, the sister in the back, not only did she not go along with it, she did this. Uh, hey, I'm calling you out, but am I right? Did you do that? Yes, you did. And you know what? That's a good thing. Kudos to you. To you too, brother. I got to tell you something, folks. The thing is, did you notice that all of you, when you did that, you kind of chuckled, right? And that's because it's funny. I mean, it's funny. Not funny in, oh, David just made a very droll and witty comment funny. No, funny in the, like, stupid funny. Like, ridiculous funny. Like, that's, like, absurd humor, right? I mean, to say that I can tell Lloyd how he has to live his life because of who my parents are, or even better, that I can say how all of society has to be operating because of the divine right of kings? That's foolish. That's foolishness beyond. That is absurd. That's hilarious. And 500 years ago, human beings just like you not only said it, but they believed it. And if they didn't believe it, they wouldn't dare say otherwise. And that's because... That's how society operates. And now here, y'all, hold on because the text ain't going to get metaphysical on y'all. We are all individually participating in creating our collective reality. Another way to say that is, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. It's true. Like the flat earth. Like the flat earth. I mean, literally, like culture is created by us as a joint experiment. So if it is true that the United States of America is fundamentally racist, sexist, and class oppressive, and it is, then we are all actually individually participating in creating it and at the very least letting it happen. So there is a, there is a responsibility there. Now, th this takes me to my next topic, which is legal personhood. You'll notice that I do not have corporate personhood, but instead legal personhood. And that's because the concept of legal personhood means the ability to assert rights. If you have the ability to assert rights under law, that means you're a legal person. If you have rights that you can assert under the legal system, that's what legal personhood means. And in fact, the struggle, the fight over who is or is not a legal person has been at the core of so much of not only U.S. history, but very especially social movement history. And we'll get into that in just a moment because I want to now go to the last concept, and that's finally the corporation. Since this concept is so important, let's ask the same question. What language is that from? It's from Latin. Can we break it down? Corpus means body. And now for extra credit points, if I've got any Latin scholars, the suffix T-I-O-N, Yes, that's right. To make or create. So literally, the word corporation means to make or create a body. And by body, we mean literally a physical body. And that's because in law school, by the way, any other lawyers in the crowd besides me? It's a friendly crowd, Luke. I think they'll be all right with it. They already know. They already know. <laughs> so, Luke, a question. Do you remember in law school being taught a corporation is a legal fiction. A fictional legal, a fictional legal entity. In fact, a corporation is a legal fiction is something that often non-lawyers have either heard or know or understand. So I'm going to ask the question, how many in this crowd have at least heard the phrase a corporation is a legal fiction? Look at the hands go up, right? Or an artificial person. Or artificial person. All right, same thing. So it's a legal fiction. But check this out. It begs the question. What does the word fiction mean? False. False. Made up. Not true. So literally, a corporation doesn't exist. But in law school, we'll, talk, we'll pretend like this abstract concept where you bring together a group of material, resources, contractual agreements, and we're going to pretend like it's one thing so we can treat it under law. And of course, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true... It's true. Poof. Presto changeo. We create a corporation. Literally, a corporation is a, not just a legal fiction, it's a construct. 
In other words, it is constructed by the collective agreement that will act like that it is true. That is a very important idea. And the word corporation is Latin because the first corporations ever created as a construct by the genius of human beings was created during the Roman Republic. Not, by the way, during the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we spent more time asking, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States. Just saying. <laughs> planting seeds, you know, planting seeds. <laughs> point, is, <laughs> point is that the word corporation comes from Latin because the Romans invented the idea of using this construct, and they did it for a reason, to do certain things. For example, have you all heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Mm -hmm. Right? That road system was literally designed by and built by a Roman corporation. Likewise, the aqueduct system, that amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula, that engineering feat, that marvel, was actually designed, constructed, maintained under the auspices of a Roman corporation. Likewise, the first universities that we would understand to operate as a university, the word university is a Roman word too. You know why? Because the first universities were Roman corporations. In fact, the hospitals, that the idea of a hospital and, and utilizing it as one, the first hospitals in, in sort of modern times were, were operated as a Roman corporation. So here's a quick question. What is a road system, an aqueduct or a water system, a university, a hospital, what do they all have in common? They serve the public good. They're all public services. Each and every one of those are public services. And the genius of the corporation is to take private money, resources, or material to put it to public use. But there's another way the government takes private money, right? What's that way that we normally think of? Taxes. And I want to be clear, I'm not here to denigrate taxes. I think taxation is a very important thing. In fact, people say that Lansing, the city of, is suffering from a budget crisis. They say that the state of, Detroit, uh, the state of Michigan is suffering from a budget crisis. It's not true. It's not a, we're not actually suffering from a crisis, an economic crisis. It's an allocation crisis. This economy is producing more wealth than has ever been produced in the history of human beings. It's just being concentrated in a few hands. You want to solve every one of the uh, economic problems that we have here? I got three words. Y'all ready? Tax the rich. Problem solved. Every one of them. So I am not here to speak against taxes. Like I, It's a very important idea. But the difference is that taxes are mandatory. I mean, in a taxing program, the government does not say, uh, can we persuade you to please pay your taxes? Or what might I do to entice you to invest in the society to pay your taxes, right? Ta uh, the taxing idea is a mandatory governmental program. The genius of the corporation is that it took private money, material, and other resources on a voluntary basis and put it to public use. And that is a genius idea. Do not let it be said that the move to amend coalition is anti-corporation. We are not anti-corporation. Do not let it be said that the move to amend coalition is anti-corporate. There, there are important roles for corporation as, a, as an instrument, as an idea to play. But of course, the problem is that the modern transnational corporation doesn't exactly operate that way, does it? That's because the modern transnational corporation actually comes out of the 14th, 15th, and 16th century of Europe. You know, the age of discovery. I had to put discovery in quotation marks because I already told y'all I would tell the truth. And it's not truthful to call the 14th, 15th, and 16th century the age of discovery. After all, what did they discover? For that matter, who is they in that sentence? Who is they? The Europeans. And what did the Europeans or they discover? Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash! There were people living there. They weren't lost. They didn't need to be discovered. So instead, let's actually tell the truth. The, that time period is the age of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. There's one word, I think, that really captures that era. It is the age of genocide. genocide. 
Empire. Because you know what empire means? It means beating people down. It means crushing them. It means killing them. It means stealing their resources away from them. There is nothing more brutal, more ugly than the genocidal practice of imperialism. And that's what that age was. And the reason that I really want to underscore this is that the modern transnational corporation didn't just happen to be created during this time period. Stay with me here, folks. The modern transnational corporation was created as an instrument of that genocidal empire. It was done on purpose. In fact, one of the earliest corporations was known as the East India Company, which was literally designed to make a profit out of killing and murdering and stealing from the subcontinent of India. Likewise, another early corporation was an outfit known as the Africa Trading Company. Does anybody want to guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? People. Thank you so much. Say it again. People. People. Because, and I want to say this, and I'll use myself as an example. When I experience in my head, and I often do, because I do this, like, I do this presentation a lot. I knew what I was going to say. But even in my own head, when I say, what did the Africa Trading Company trade? It is not unusual, unbidden, that a different word pops into my head. Slaves. And may I say that when that word pops into my head is an example of my own colonized thinking that I have been subjected to, that you have been subjected to, that you have been subjected to. We are subjected to a story, a creation myth about how the world operates and how history operates. It takes a conscious effort on the part of most white people to actually immediately say, what did the Africa Trading Company trade? People. And may I say... With some trepidation, people basically just like me. And I say that with full awareness of my pigment and my skin color, but I say it because I promised you I would tell the truth. And the truth of the matter is that the Africa Trading Company traded human beings. And I am a human being. And if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, they will tell you race does not exist. I mean, absolutely pigment exists and different characteristics, even ethnicity. That exists, to be sure. But no scientist, no biologist would elevate those kind of classific those characteristics and those differences to a taxonomy or a classification under biology. Race does not exist. But check it out. Race doesn't exist, but racism damn sure does. How can that possibly be? Why, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true, so poof, presto changeo, we create race. Race is a construct as surely as the corporation is a construct. And why do I go down this road? Because I think it's important for us to understand the construct of race gets created during the same era of the genocidal practice of the corporation or the transnational corporation for a reason. And that reason is to justify slavery. Now, I'm not saying that the, the corporation created the idea of slavery. I mean, sadly, slavery had pre-existed that time period. But let's be clear. Before the era of race and the, and the transnational corporation and that level of imperialism, there was a different version of it. You see, if Lloyd and I lived in uh, 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 different tribes and there was a river separating us and my tribe went to war against Lloyd's tribe and my tribe will win this war and by the way, why might my tribe win this war? Stronger, like more people? Better technology, better weapons. Anything else? More resources. These are all very good, like to, to sort of lay out the, 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 the most logical reasons why my tribe might win these wars. These are all very good. But of course, I haven't given you enough facts to really know why my tribe wins this war, right? Should I tell you why my tribe wins this war? Because I'm telling the story. <laughs> ah, it's kind of important, y'all. And I want to challenge us to recognize that whoever is telling the story has inordinate power over the narrative frame. Because you see, we understand the world through the stories we tell each other. 
And I think that, one of the, again, that one of the most wonderful things about the Occupy Wall Street movement is that it's giving us an opportunity to tell each other different stories. So unfortunately for you, Lloyd, I am telling this story. So my tribe wins this war. I put my spear up against Lloyd's throat and say, Lloyd, you're my slave. So let me ask you all something. What is the philosophical, intellectual justification for David to enslave Lloyd? I got the spear. There's not even really even like, like in the occasion that I've just described, you, I, I've got the spear. It's power over. There's not even an effort to try to justify it. Check it out. I will submit to you that race gets created as an absolutely profane, disgusting, but effort to somehow philosophically or intellectually justify the enslavement of an entire group of human beings for no other reason than pigment. Another way to say that is the concept of racism and corporatism and militarism are inextricably linked. And let me tell you something, folks. I am not the first American to say that. Because probably the greatest American orator of all time, our greatest political orator, said basically the same thing in what I believe is his best political speech. Now, the person I'm thinking about, it's not his most famous speech, because his most famous speech is, I have a dream. Who am I talking about? King, right? I'm talking about King. And, and I have a dream is a beautiful speech. But there's a reason that that's the speech that we are taught. And that's the reason that that is the speech that is delivered and listened to on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. But for my money, the speech that I wish that we would hear, I wish more people would read, I wish more people would know, I wish that would be broadcast on the day that we honor him. Say it again. Beyond Vietnam or beyond war, because that speech wasn't delivered in Washington, D.C., but at the Riverside Church in Harlem. Beyond war or beyond Vietnam, where King said, and this is a man of faith, a man of the cloth, who said, the United States of America is suffering from a moral and spiritual decay. And that is because we have never addressed the triple evils, and he used that word, the triple evils of materialism, militarism and racism and he says that unless and until the United States comes to terms with that that decay will continue and may I suggest to you that King was right then he's right now the problem the reason that we are suffering to this day is we have not been willing to confront the reality of racism the reality of what extreme materialism and the the extreme disparities of wealth actually creates and militarism and domination in order to make that happen. And so since I've finally gotten us from my long history of the world from the, the Roman Empire all the way up to finally mentioning the United States, here's another pop quiz, y'all. How many original colonies in the United States of America? 13. That was a gimme. And by the way, 13 colonies, colonies, colonization, imperialism. I wonder if that's related. Let's flag that. Maybe we'll come back to it. Thirteen original colonies. And so here's a question. How many of those original 13 colonies were actually corporations? It was a trick question, but the man is on top. What's your name, brother? Apachu. Apachu has already spoiled my, uh, my little trick question because he's on the job. That's okay, Apachu. I'm going to work with you on that because uh, <laughs> he's right. All of them. And why is that? Because the word corporation means to make or create. And I will tell you that the king created Massachusetts. Now some of you might say, uh-uh, Massachusetts was already there. And that's why it's a trick question. The land was there. The people who lived on the land. The forest and the rivers and the streams and the fish and the deer. You know, reality was there. But the king had to create Massachusetts. And when the king created Massachusetts, did the king create the state of Massachusetts? No. Do you all know what the king created? Nicely done. Apachu is going to... Uh, you want to come up here and finish up? Apachu? <laughs> hey, it's, it's really just an anti-imperialism speech, right? But that's okay. Let's go through this. Because I, I, I do want to uh, finish it up. And then we'll open it up. But I do think that it's important to understand the king created 
uh, Massachusetts. And he did it by the creation and the use of a charter, which is the legal document that creates a corporation. And when the king does this, the king created Massachusetts, not as the state of Massachusetts, not as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but as the Massachusetts Bay Trading Company. It was a for-profit joint stock company or corporation. That's basically what, if you'll remember from your history, Luke, legal history, a joint stock company is the, the first corporations were known as joint stock companies. So the Korean Cree... Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, because the, you had your mercenaries who fought for kingdoms, and they were called companies of. Companies. That's right. And home meaning together, bond meaning food, fighting together for food. This is imperialism at its nutshell. It's imperialism at its nutshell. So the charter is used to create. Uh, these for-profit companies and I want to be clear about something folks in the American Revolution the American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king so today perhaps we might do more than just call for more socially responsible corporations I don't know about you but I'm sick and tired of being told that well we can't question and challenge the reality of the corporate state but we should just ask them to be nicer we should try to reform them you know, let's be, let's be clear, the transnational corporation is destroying the planet and creating this racist, sexist, and class oppressive world with the plunder, and I don't think that you play nice uh, in, re in response to this sort of thing. This is crazy. You make it stop. That's actually what the appropriate response ought to be. And so, again, folks, think about it. Is it really true that all we want is a more socially responsible corporation? I mean, is it really all we want is to say, would you please not kill quite so many coal miners in West Virginia? Would you please not destroy the entire frigging Gulf of Mexico, British Petroleum Corporation? I mean, can't we raise our aspirations higher? Is that, like, is that what we want, a little less death? Is that really the chant? Is that really what, what, what's motivating us? A little less death, a little less destruction. Right? I mean, let's actually be honest. Let's like cut to it and say what we need is a different world. We need a whole different structure and a whole different system so that human needs are being met and not just human needs, but can we even go further and say we need to imagine the needs of the rivers and the fish and the birds and the other non homo sapien species that are out there. Can we actually really get down to really rethinking how our society ought to operate? Now, we do know, by the way, that the king does actually ultimately get thrown out, and we know that a new charter is used to create a new government. And what is the charter of this new government? The supreme law of the land? What's it called? Our governing document? The U.S. Constitution. Here's a question, for real. How many people here have read the U.S. Constitution? Let me be honest. All right, a lot of hands go up. Good. So, y'all grade my paper on this one. Don't just let... Uh, Apache be the only one. <laughs> See if I get this right. I'm going to submit to you that whenever you look at the Constitution, a very important way to look at it, if you look at it, you'll see that there are two principal actors. The first actor is the most important actor. In fact, it's so important, it's the first three words of that document. We the people. We the people. You know, all I have to do is put my hand up to my ear and people will say those words in unison. We the people. And that's because we, the people, come together to create the second idea, which is government. There you go. The Constitution is the codification of the social contract. We, the people, in this document, are described as being free and sovereign. And what does the word sovereign mean again? The authority to rule. We claim the authority to rule ourselves. Government does not rule over us. Government does not have sovereignty. Government is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. Government is accountable to whom? The people. I like how that's going. It's got a ring to it. We the people are free and sovereign because we have rights. Government does not have rights. Government only has duties. And in fact, the interchange between rights and duties is the very definition of law, at least in the Western jurisprudence. And this is important to understand, folks, because you see, we the people 
have all the power. And that is a wonderful idea. And like we're here in the city of Lansing, right? What's the population of Lansing, more or less? 100,000? So I want to just relish and acknowledge that 100,000 people of Lansing have all the political power, right? That we, the people of Lansing, that, they have the power to decide how their society ought to operate. That's phenomenal. But let me tell you something. I love the fact that 100,000 Lansing residents have all the political power, but I do not want to go to the meeting where 100,000 people decide where all the stop signs go. Right? I mean, I love political meetings. I am not going to that one. And that's because, and you think about it this way, we the people have all the power, but we delegate a certain amount of power to government. How much would, why would we do that? We give them only enough power to perform the duties that in the social contract we've told them to do. Think of it this way. Oh, and the one thing that government can never do when discharging its duties, making laws and such, the one thing government can never do is violate your individual rights. And that's the brilliance of it. In our private realm, we have rights that are sacrosanct, but there's also a public realm. And I think it's really important to recognize this. This framework says, we the people have all of the power. We have, are free and sovereign. We have individual rights that are protected. But even with all the power, we delegate a certain amount of power to government. If government is supposed to be responsible and accountable to us. Government is not sovereign over the people. Government does not have rights over the people. Government only has duties. And th those duties are in order to perform and the social contract that we have codified. And the one thing that government can never do, even through a democratic process, is to violate an individual rights. You see how that works? Isn't that brilliant? I think, I do, I'm totally serious. This is beautiful. The idea that we the people have all of the power, that government will operate as a subordinate entity to us, and that as the government, as the representative body goes about its business, it can never violate my individual rights. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. We should try that in this country. This would work. And I'm not even joking. This is brilliant. This would work. The problem is not in this framework. The problem is, and before I go one second further waxing poetic about the beauty and the brilliance of the U.S. Constitution, time out. Somebody tell me what year the U.S. Constitution gets ratified, either uh, ratified and becomes a supreme law of the land, or the Constitutional Convention, either year if you know it. N nice. 1787 is the uh, Articles of the Confederation. 1789 is the ratification. So that's whenever it actually comes into being. 1789 is the actual founding of the Constitution where it actually gets ratified, not just drafted, which is 1787. So the reason I have a date certain up there is so that I can ask this question. In 1789, who was a legal person? Who was part of we the people with the ability to assert rights? What were their characteristics? White, white male, male landowners. landowners. Literally, if you're not white, you do not get to be a person. You're not part of we the people. If you're not a man, you don't get to be part of we the people. And if you don't own enough property, you're not part of we the people. So the problem is not in this rhetoric or in this framing. This is a brilliant framing. The problem is in its implementation and the definition of legal personhood. Because here's a question, what percentage of the adult U.S. population was actually a legal person in 1789? Anybody know? 15%? 10%? Ladies and gentlemen of Lansing, you are not sufficiently cynical. <laughs> because the answer is 5%. That low. If you, if you actually define full legal status you will find that about 5% of the entire population were fully vested in participatory and the ability to actually participate in all of the governing structure. What is it up to now? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> we'll get to that. But <laughs> there's another way, folks, there is another way to express that fraction that I think that we need to say out loud. It means 95% of the adult human beings were not legally persons. In fact, the late great historian Howard Zinn said it well when he said the entire history of the United States can be understood as a series of struggles by actual human beings to de be defined as legal persons with rights under our Constitution. 
So some people might say, all right, Cobb, you got a scathing indictment against imperialism of 500 years ago, but hey, man, slavery's gone. Women can vote. It's all good. To which I say, au contraire, mon frere. It's not all good because now it's time to reintroduce the corporation. And in order to do that, I'm going to tell you first and foremost, in 1789 and for the first 75 years to create a corporation in this country required an act of the state legislature. And it had to be literally the lower house passed the bill, then it went to the upper house or the state senate, and then the governor had to sign it. And then if a charter was granted as a privilege, not a right, but a privilege, that charter was limited in time and all you could, you had to prove a public need and all you could do was that specific public need and if you ever did anything against the public interest or caused any public harm, do you know what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. revoked. There was a long history of revoking these charters and I ask all that to say today to form a corporation, you need a piece of paper, file $60 with the Secretary of State. Poof, it'll be created just like that. It, they are virtually, they are virtually, they are virtually given away, right? There's virtually no control over their initial creations. I put all that up there because I want to be clear that if this framework is helpful, and, and I hope it is, does this make sense how the United States is supposed to operate and how our government is supposed to operate? This, let me do this, uh, Apache, then we'll get to you. So if that's helpful, now it's time to introduce the corporation onto this framework. So if it is true that it takes an act of government to create the corporation, which it is true, and if the corporate charter can be used to hold the corporation subordinate and accountable, which it can, the corporate charter describes what the duties of the corporation are or should be, and I will assert that a corporation should only be allowed to exist since it's being created by our government, if it serves the public interest, then don't you see that a corporation should be on this side of the line? I mean, doesn't that just make sense? And so, when the U.S. Supreme Court comes waltzing in and in an act of supreme judicial activism says, oh no, we're going to say a corporation is on this side of the line and should be considered a person with rights under our Constitution, it perverts the whole framework. That's the linchpin, folks. Corporate personhood is not just a stupid idea which it is. Corporate personhood is not just illogical, which it is. Corporate personhood is one of the linchpins for how the 1%, the ruling elite, have literally hijacked our government from us. They have stolen from us not just campaign finance laws, they've stolen from us the ability to create the society that we want. Because any law that attempts to control the most dominant institution of our time, the corporation, can be subject to being overturned. And let me be clear, folks, environmental laws get overturned because they violate the constitutional rights of a corporation. Public health laws get overturned because they violate the, law, the corporate rights of a constitution. Public health laws, public safety laws, worker protection laws, and most recently in the Citizens United case, even campaign finance laws designed to protect the integrity of our elections gets overturned. So I want to be clear, there is a movement that says, ya basta, enough already. It is time for us to actually build the movement that we need to strip the courts of the illegitimate ability to create these, these doctrines, because it's not just a law. It's not just one case. These are bedrock legal doctrines for how our society has been stolen from us. And that effort is called Move to Amend. It's a multiracial, multi-ethnic group of groups, individuals, locally based and nationally based from across the country that are coming together to make it clear we are going to have a constitutional amendment to actually create a democracy movement in the United States of America. And so I saw Patrick, yeah, you can applaud that, right? We are on the move. And a year ago, we only got formed after Citizens United. In one year, we were already up to 20,000 people. Today, two years, we're at 160,000 people. In one year after we had first formed, we had five local uh, groups that were self-identifying as Move to Amend affiliates. Today, we have 60. We had plans to try to get resolutions passed in state uh, or in uh, city councils. Today, 50 of them have passed. 
We had ideas to not just do resolutions, but actually put it on the ballot so voters can vote on it. And already, one year uh, after beginning that plan, we've had them pat got on the ballot in Missoula, Montana, where it passed 73% of the vote. We got it on the ballot in Boulder, Colorado, where it passed 74% of the vote. We got it on the ballot in Madison, Wisconsin, where it's passed by 84% of the vote. What? 84%. These are landslides, folks. There is a movement that's getting larger, stronger, and better organized every day. And before we open it up for questions, I'm going to ask each and every one of you, if you'd like to join this movement, here's how to do so. And I want to be very clear, what I'm passing is not a petition that we're going to submit to elected officials on bended knee. This is an organizing petition. If you sign this, and I hope you will, that we expect to be in touch with you. We'd like to actually ask you to get involved in this effort because we think, frankly, that this corporate person, I see your hand, this corporate personhood issue is the defining moment. Which side are you on? And as that goes around, if you, want, if you don't want to sign up, that's fine. Just pass it. I won't be upset. I won't be angry. I mean, I'll be surprised. But, but, but all I will ask you is that comes around. If you're going to sign, print legibly. I see your hand. As an organizer, nothing is more uh, uh, heartbreaking than not to be able to catch up with somebody. 